Chapter Seventeen. Dr. Poulain lived in the Rue d'Orléans, in a small ground-floor establishment, consisting of a lobby, a sitting-room, and two bedrooms. A closet opening into the lobby and the bedroom had been turned into a study for the doctor. The kitchen, the servant's bedroom, and a small cellar were situated in a wing of the house, a huge pile built in the time of the empire, on the site of an old mansion of which the garden still remained, though it had been divided among the three ground-floor tenants. Nothing had been changed in the doctor's house since it was built. Paint and paper and ceilings were all redolent of the empire. The grimy deposits of forty years lay thick on walls and ceilings, on paper and paint and mirrors and gilding. And yet this little establishment, in the depths of the Marais, paid a rent of a thousand francs. Madame Poulain, the doctor's mother, aged sixty-seven, was ending her days in the second bedroom. She worked for a breeches-maker, stitching men's leggings, breeches, belts, and braces, anything, in fact, that is made in a way of business which has somewhat fallen off of late years. Her whole time was spent in keeping her son's house and superintending the one servant. She never went abroad, and took the air in the little garden entered through the glass door of the sitting-room. Twenty years previously, when her husband died, she sold his business to his best workman, who gave his master's widow work enough to earn a daily wage of thirty sous. She had made every sacrifice to educate her son. At all costs, he should occupy a higher station than his father before him, and now she was proud of her Esculapius. She believed in him, and sacrificed everything to him as before. She was happy to take care of him, to work and put by a little money, and dream of nothing but his welfare, and love him with an intelligent love of which every mother is not capable. For instance, Madame Poulain remembered that she had been a working girl. She would not injure her son's prospects. He should not be ashamed by his mother, for the good woman's grammar was something of the same kind as Madame Cibot's and for this reason she kept in the background and went to her room of her own accord if any distinguished patient came to consult the doctor or if some old schoolfellow or fellow-student chanced to call dr poulain had never had occasion to blush for the mother whom he revered and this sublime love of hers more than atoned for a defective education the breeches maker's business sold for about twenty thousand francs and the widow invested the money in the funds in 1820 the income of eleven hundred francs per annum derived from this source was at one time her whole fortune for many a year the neighbors used to see the doctor's linen hanging out to dry upon a clothes-line in the garden and the servant and madame poulain thriftily washed everything at home a piece of domestic economy which did not a little to injure the doctor's practice for it was thought that if he was so poor it must be through his own fault her eleven hundred francs scarcely did more than pay the rent during those early days madame poulain good stout little old woman was the breadwinner and the poor household lived upon her earnings after twelve years of perseverance upon a rough and stony road Dr. Poulain, at last, was making an income of three thousand francs, and Madame Poulain had an income of about five thousand francs at her disposal. Five thousand francs, for those who know Paris, means a bare subsistence. The sitting-room where patients waited for an interview was shabbily furnished. There was the inevitable mahogany sofa covered with yellow-flowered Utrecht velvet, four easy chairs, a tea-table, a console, and half a dozen chairs, all the property of the deceased breeches-maker, and chosen by him. A lyre-shaped clock between two Egyptian candlesticks still preserved its glass shade intact. You asked yourself how the yellow chintz window curtains covered with red flowers had contrived to hang together for so long, for evidently they had come from the Jouy factory, and Oberkampf received the Emperor's congratulations upon similar hideous productions of the cotton industry in 1809. The doctor's consulting room was fitted up in the same style, with household stuff from the paternal chamber. It looked stiff 
poverty-stricken and bare what patient could put faith in the skill of any unknown doctor who could not even furnish his house and this in a time when advertising is all-powerful when we gild the gas-lamps in the place de la concorde to console the poor man for his poverty by reminding him that he is rich as a citizen the antechamber did duty as a dining-room the servant sat at her sewing there whenever she was not busy in the kitchen or keeping the doctor's mother company from the dingy short curtains in the windows you would have guessed at the shabby thrift behind them without setting foot in the dreary place what could those wall cupboards contain but stale scraps of food chipped earthenware corks used over and over again indefinitely soiled table linen odds and ends that could descend but one step lower into the dust heap and all the squalid necessities of a pinched household in paris in these days when the five-franc piece is always lurking in our thoughts and intruding itself into our speech dr poulain aged thirty-three was still a bachelor heaven had bestowed on him a mother with no connections in ten years he had not met with the faintest pretext for a romance in his professional career his practice lay among clerks and small manufacturers people in his own sphere of life with homes very much like his own his richer patients were butchers bakers and the more substantial tradespeople of the neighborhood these for the most part attributed their recovery to nature as an excuse for paying for the services of a medical man who came on foot at the rate of two francs per visit in his profession a carriage is more necessary than medical skill a humdrum monotonous life tells in the end upon the most adventurous spirit a man fashions himself to his lot he accepts a commonplace existence and dr poulain after ten years of his practice continued his labors of sisyphus without the despair that made early days so bitter and yet like every soul in paris he cherished a dream remonencq was happy in his dream la cibot had a dream of her own and dr poulain too dreamed some day he would be called in to attend a rich and influential patient would effect a positive cure and the patient would procure a post for him he would be head surgeon to a hospital medical officer of a prison or police court or doctor to the boulevard theatres he had come by his present appointment as doctor to the mairie in this very way la cibot had called him in when the landlord of the house in the rue de normandie fell ill he had treated the case with complete success m pillerault the patient took an interest in the young doctor called to thank him and saw his carefully hidden poverty count popinot the cabinet minister had married m pillerault's grand-niece and greatly respected her uncle of him therefore m pillerault had asked for the post which poulain had now held for two years that appointment and its meagre salary came just in time to prevent a desperate step poulain was thinking of emigration and for a frenchman it is a kind of death to leave france dr poulain went you may be sure to thank count popinot but as count popinot's family physician was the celebrated horace bianchon it was pretty clear that his chances of gaining a footing in that house were something of the slenderest the poor doctor had fondly hoped for the patronage of a powerful cabinet minister one of the twelve or fifteen cards which a cunning hand has been shuffling for sixteen years on the green baize of the council table and now he dropped back again into his marais his old groping life among the poor and the small tradespeople with the privilege of issuing certificates of death for a yearly stipend of twelve hundred francs dr poulain had distinguished himself to some extent as a house student he was a prudent practitioner and not without experience his deaths caused no scandal he had plenty of opportunities of studying all kinds of complaints in anima vili 
judge therefore of the spleen that he nourished the expression of his countenance lengthy and not too cheerful to begin with at times was positively appalling set a tartuffe's all devouring eyes and the sour humour of an alceste in a sallow parchment visage and try to imagine for yourself the gait bearing and expression of a man who thought himself as good a doctor as the illustrious bianchon and felt that he was held down in his narrow lot by an iron hand he could not help comparing his receipts ten francs a day if he was fortunate with bianchon's five or six hundred are the hatreds and jealousies of democracy incomprehensible after this ambitious and continually thwarted he could not reproach himself he had once already tried his fortune by inventing a purgative pill something like morrison's and entrusted the business operations to an old hospital chum a house student who afterwards took a retail drug business but unluckily the druggist smitten with the charms of a ballet dancer of the ambigu comique found himself at length in the bankruptcy court and as the patent had been taken out in his name his partner was literally without a remedy and the important discovery enriched the purchaser of the business the sometime house student set sail for mexico that land of gold taking poor poulain's little savings with him and to add insult to injury the opera dancer treated him as an extortioner when he applied to her for his money not a single rich patient had come to him since he had the luck to cure old m pillerault poulain made his rounds on foot scouring the marais like a lean cat and obtained from two to forty sous out of a score of visits the paying patient was a phenomenon about as rare as that anomalous fowl known as a white blackbird in all sublunary regions the briefless barrister the doctor without a patient are pre-eminently the two types of a decorous despair peculiar to this city of paris it is mute dull despair in human form dressed in a black coat and trousers with shining seams that recall the zinc on an attic roof a glistening satin waistcoat a hat preserved like a relic a pair of old gloves and a cotton shirt the man is the incarnation of a melancholy poem sombre as the secrets of the conciergerie other kinds of poverty the poverty of the artist actor painter musician or poet are relieved and lightened by the artist's joviality the reckless gaiety of the bohemian border country the first stage of the journey to the thebaid of genius but these two black-coated professions that go afoot through the street are brought continually in contact with disease and dishonor they see nothing of human nature but its sores in the forlorn first stages and beginnings of their career they eye competitors suspiciously and defiantly concentrated dislike and ambition flashes out in glances like the breaking forth of hidden flames let two schoolfellows meet after twenty years the rich man will avoid the poor he does not recognize him he is afraid even to glance into the gulf which fate has set between him and the friend of other years the one has been borne through life on the mettlesome steed called fortune or wafted on the golden clouds of success the other has been making his way in underground paris through the sewers and bears the marks of his career upon him how many a chum of old days turned aside at the sight of the doctor's great coat and waistcoat with this explanation it should be easy to understand how dr poulain came to lend himself so readily to the farce of la cibot's illness and recovery greed of every kind ambition of every nature is not easy to hide the doctor examined his patient found that every organ was sound and healthy admired the regularity of her pulse and the perfect ease of her movements and as she continued to moan aloud 
he saw that for some reason she found it convenient to lie at death's door the speedy cure of a serious imaginary disease was sure to cause a sensation in the neighborhood the doctor would be talked about he made up his mind at once he talked of rupture and of taking it in time and thought even worse of the case than la cibot herself the portress was plied with various remedies and finally underwent a sham operation crowned with complete success poulain repaired to the arsenal library looked out a grotesque case in some of desplein's records of extraordinary cures and fitted the details to madame cibot modestly attributing the success of the treatment to the great surgeon in whose steps he said he walked such is the impudence of beginners in paris everything is made to serve as a ladder by which to climb upon the scene and as everything even the rungs of a ladder will wear out in time the new members of every profession are at a loss to find the right sort of wood of which to make steps for themselves there are moments when the parisian is not propitious he grows tired of raising pedestals pouts like a spoiled child and will have no more idols or to state it more accurately paris cannot always find a proper object for infatuation now and then the vein of genius gives out and at such times the parisian may turn supercilious he is not always willing to bow down and gild mediocrity madame cibot entering in her usual unceremonious fashion found the doctor and his mother at table before a bowl of lamb's lettuce the cheapest of all salad stuffs the dessert consisted of a thin wedge of brie cheese flanked by a plate of specked foreign apples and a dish of mixed dry fruits known as quatre mondiens in which the raisin stalks were abundantly conspicuous you can stay mother said the doctor laying a hand on madame poulain's arm this is madame cibot of whom i have told you my respects to you madame and my duty to you sir said la cibot taking the chair which the doctor offered ah is this your mother sir she is very happy to have a son who has such talent he saved my life madame brought me back from the depths the widow hearing madame cibot praise her son in this way thought her a delightful woman i have just come to tell you that between ourselves poor monsieur pons is doing very badly sir and i have something to say to you about him let us go into the sitting-room interrupted the doctor and with a significant gesture he indicated the servant in the sitting-room la cibot explained her position with regard to the pair of nutcrackers at very considerable length she repeated the history of her loan with added embellishments and gave a full account of the immense services rendered during the past ten years to messieurs pons and schmucke the two old men to all appearance could not exist without her motherly care she posed as an angel she told so many lies one after another watering them with her tears that old madame poulain was quite touched you understand my dear sir she concluded that i really ought to know how far i can depend on monsieur pons's intentions supposing that he should not die not that i want him to die for looking after those two innocents is my life madame you see still when one of them is gone i shall look after the other for my own part i was built by nature to rival mothers without nobody to care for nobody to take for a child i don't know what i should do so if m poulain only would he might do me a service for which i should be very grateful and that is to say a word to m pons for me goodness me an annuity of a thousand francs is that too much i ask you to m schmucke it would be so much gained our dear patient said that he should recommend me to the german poor man it is his idea no doubt that m schmucke should be his heir but what is a man that cannot put two ideas together in french 
and besides he would be quite capable of going back to germany he will be in such despair over his friend's death the doctor grew grave my dear madame cibot he said this sort of thing does not in the least concern a doctor i should not be allowed to exercise my profession if it was known that i interfered in the matter of my patient's testamentary dispositions the law forbids a doctor to receive a legacy from a patient a stupid law what is to hinder me from dividing my legacy with you la cibot said immediately i will go further said the doctor my professional conscience will not permit me to speak to m pons of his death in the first place he is not so dangerously ill that there is any need to speak of it and in the second such talk coming from me might give a shock to the system that would do him real harm and then his illness might terminate fatally i don't put on gloves to tell him to get his affairs in order cried madame cibot and he is none the worse for that he is used to it there is nothing to fear not a word more about it my dear madame cibot these things are not within a doctor's province it is a notary's business but my dear monsieur poulain suppose that monsieur pons of his own accord should ask you how he is and whether he had better make his arrangements then would you refuse to tell him that if you want to get better it is an excellent plan to set everything in order then you might just slip in a little word for me oh if he talks of making his will i certainly shall not dissuade him said the doctor very well that is settled i came to thank you for your care of me she added as she slipped a folded paper containing three gold coins into the doctor's hands it is all i can do at the moment ah my dear monsieur poulain if i were rich you should be rich you that are the image of providence on earth madame you have an angel for a son la cibot rose to her feet madame poulain bowed amiably and the doctor went to the door with the visitor just then a sudden lurid gleam of light flashed across the mind of this lady macbeth of the streets she saw clearly that the doctor was her accomplice he had taken the fee for the sham illness monsieur poulain she began how can you refuse to say a word or two to save me from want when you helped me in the affair of my accident the doctor felt that the devil had him by the hair as the saying is he felt too that the hair was being twisted round the pitiless red claw startled and afraid lest he should sell his honesty for such a trifle he answered the diabolical suggestion by another no less diabolical listen my dear madame cibot he said as he drew her into his consulting-room i will now pay a debt of gratitude that i owe you for my appointment to the mairie we go shares she asked briskly in what in the legacy you do not know me said dr poulain drawing himself up like valerius publicola let us have no more of that i have a friend an old schoolfellow of mine a very intelligent young fellow and we are so much the more intimate because our lives have fallen out very much in the same way he was studying law while i was a house student he was engrossing deeds in maitre couture's office his father was a shoemaker and mine was a breeches maker he has not found any one to take much interest in his career nor has he any capital for after all capital is only to be had from sympathizers he could only afford to buy a provincial connection at mantes and so little do provincials understand the parisian intellect that they set all sorts of intrigues on foot against him the wretches cried la cibot yes said the doctor they combined against him to such purpose that they forced him to sell his connection by misrepresenting something that he had done the attorney for the crown interfered he belonged to the place and sided with his fellow-townsmen my friend's name is fraisier 
he is lodged as i am and he is even leaner and more threadbare he took refuge in our arrondissement and is reduced to appear for clients in the police court or before the magistrate he lives in the rue de la perle close by go to number nine third floor and you will see his name on the door on the landing painted in gilt letters on a small square of red leather fraisier makes a special point of disputes among the porters workmen and poor folk in the arrondissement and his charges are low he is an honest man for i need not tell you that if he had been a scamp he would be keeping his carriage by now i will call and see my friend fraisier this evening go to him early to-morrow he knows m louchard the bailiff m tabareau the clerk of the court and the justice of the peace m vitel and m trognon the notary he is even now looked upon as one of the best men of business in the quarter if he takes charge of your interests if you can secure him as m pons's adviser you will have a second self in him you see but do not make dishonourable proposals to him as you did just now to me he has a head on his shoulders you will understand each other and as for acknowledging his services i will be your intermediary madame cibot looked askance at the doctor is that the lawyer who helped madame florimond the haberdasher in the rue vieille du temple out of a fix in that matter of her friend's legacy the very same wasn't it a shame that she did not marry him after he had gained two thousand francs a year for her exclaimed la cibot and she thought to clear off scores by making him a present of a dozen shirts and a couple of dozen pocket handkerchiefs an outfit in short my dear madame cibot that outfit cost a thousand francs and fraisier was just setting up for himself in the quarter and wanted the things very badly and what was more she paid the bill without asking any questions that affair brought him clients and now he is very busy but in my line a practice brings it is only the righteous that suffer here below said la cibot well monsieur poulain good day and thank you and herewith begins the tragedy or if you like to have it so a terrible comedy the death of an old bachelor delivered over by circumstances too strong for him to the rapacity and greed that gathered about his bed and other forces came to the support of rapacity and greed there was the picture collector's mania that most intense of all passions there was the cupidity of the sieur fraisier whom you shall presently behold in his den a sight to make you shudder and lastly there was the auvergnat thirsting for money ready for anything even for a crime that should bring him the capital he wanted the first part of the story serves in some sort as a prelude to this comedy in which all the actors who have hitherto occupied the stage will reappear <laughs> 